Welcome to our second episode, second class of the other seminar. Today, we are going to be talking about refined homes. And it is our honor to have our guest today, uh, Usman Khan. Um, you know, most of us know him, doesn't need much by way of introduction, especially. Um, the only people here are family members. But he is happens to be my brother in law, and he's my wife's brother. And he has a distinguished career. Um, he's going to be a future intellectual that everyone needs to watch out for. He did a bachelor's in education at Brooklyn College. Prior to that, he memorized Quran in seminaries in Canada, upstate New York. And he did a bachelor's in education at Brooklyn College, after which he became a uh, chaplain and or he, he's, he worked in the Islamic school for a bit. And then he went back to uh, school. He did a master's in the Hartford Seminary in Connecticut. After that, he spent a number of years as a chaplain serving the Connecticut State Prison System. And after that, he went back to school. He just can't stay out of school. He's currently doing a PhD in Princeton University in the religion department uh, with an interest in Islam in India and South Asia. So we're honored to have him here today. He's going to be speaking about refined homes. And the topic has been shared with you. And um, it's, a, it's not exactly a chapter from any of the books, but it is a conglomerate of various chapters. So we're going to talk about everything uh, that it takes to make your home refined. Uh, without further ado, let's go. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah ar-Rahim ar-Rahim. Assalatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. So uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank all of you for uh, for coming and for Dr. Hussein uh, asking me to be here. Uh, it's uh, an honor um, to come and speak with everybody today uh, and to go over a topic like this, especially in uh, our time, our day, our age today, in which uh, something like adab, uh, akhlaq, uh, I think perhaps people don't think about it too often. It's something that's uh, not no longer squarely in our purview anymore, to a large extent. Uh, and to to rethink and to refocus and to reorient uh, ourselves um, here, I think is very important. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Uh, he said in a hadith, very famous hadith, I have not been sent except to perfect noble character. I have not been sent except to perfect good character. If we pause and we think about what that, what that statement entails, the Prophet wasallam is saying that there is no other reason for why he was sent as a prophet there is no other purpose of revelation. There is no other purpose of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking to his creation, guiding his creation, thinking of the best interest of his creation. And it all is centered around perfecting, developing, and cultivating noble character. So there is a centrality of Allah in our deen. Uh, and this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said in describing the Prophet and we created you upon the, the best, the greatest, the most noble uh, character. Uh, so the vehicle of revelation, which is the Prophet uh, he is in a state of the highest and most noble character. And then he uh, imparts that message. And this is why also 
Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet وسلم, she referred to the Prophet when they asked about his character. She said, Kana Quran, that his character was the Quran. He was a walking embodiment of the Quran. So the Prophet وسلم's character, the perfection of good character, and the revelation, Wahi, Quran, Sunnah, this is all an expression of character and all a uh, an endeavor to perfect noble character to perfect good character so uh, many many scholars of the past have spoken about this have written about this a tremendous amount of literature uh, uh, is available on this subject uh, you can go and easily find uh, books on, on, on this topic. Um, but what I found uh, very useful, very beneficial, was uh, from a scholar, Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahmatullahi alayhi. He was a scholar who died in the 14th century, uh, 7th century of the Hijrah. And he was a student of uh, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, who was a great scholar. And Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, was a great scholar himself. And in thinking about akhlaq, he summarized akhlaq, the pillars of akhlaq, into four uh, categories. Uh, and, he, and, and he said that these four categories is what uh, the entirety of uh, good akhlaq is summarized can be encompassed within these four. These are the pillars upon which all of the other uh, traits, all of the other, uh, all of the other uh, morals and ethics, they stand upon these. This is the basis. So the first one he says is sabr. Sabr. So sabr in, in, is to persevere. Sabr is to uh, be strong. Sabr is to not give in. Sabr is to keep pushing forward, to persevere. Part of sabr, he says, is also to control anger, to uh, have control over your uh, over your words, over your tongue, to be in a state of uh, serenity, tranquility, controlling yourself, not losing uh, not losing yourself, abstaining from causing harm, and abstaining from being Hasty. This is also part of sabr. So, being hasty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions this in the Quran as well, that man is, uh, is hasty. Uh, doing things too quickly without thinking. Uh, being rash. Uh, cultivating forbearance. To have him. To uh, be gentle and uh, have a sense of solemnness. He says it is a part of uh, of sabr. And uh, so many of these, so, so many, so much of what sabr en encompasses here, we find we actually need all of that in the refinement of our homes, in the cultivating of our home, in our home life. Because if you don't have any sabr in your home life, then you cannot be a functioning uh, member of your home. If you do not have sabr, and you can't deal with your children, you can't rear them. If you don't have sabr, if you don't have uh, the ability to persevere in your family life, uh, then the family uh, family life breaks down. And we see that in our times today that our homes, the Muslim home, uh, is, is failing. It is uh, failing. The divorce rate in the Muslim home is at the same level as it is in the, our broader society, which is about half. And I mean, I don't, I don't know what the statistics are exactly, and I don't know who keeps them, but it's probably more. And we all know, and we've all heard uh, stories uh, so, so much in our own communities, in our own families, even, uh, in uh, that the homes are being uh, destroyed. People are not able to persevere. They're not able to control their anger. They're not able to uh, have sub of. Uh, they're not. Uh, they're, they're. They act too hastily. They act too hastily. They're too quick to uh, 
do things that sometimes you cannot come back from. Uh, gentleness to be to be gentle. Uh, the uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that there's anything that which has gentleness in it becomes beautiful, and anything which doesn't have gentleness in it, uh, it loses its beauty, loses its charm. The second thing, the second category, the second pillar that uh, Imam Ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi, uh, points out is something called Ifa. Ifa. And he says it's to avoid ugliness in speech and conduct. To have, uh, to have good, beautiful speech, to say good words. And so much of, uh, I think, the lack that we see today uh, is the ability uh, to express yourself in a beautiful way, in a, in a good way. So we have uh, something that I, I'm, I, uh, I take a part in and I, I find a lot of interest in is poetry. And in poetry, in any language, whether it's Arabic, Urdu, Persian, English, uh, Especially in in the in the Eastern uh, languages, Arabic and Persian, Urdu, these languages. When you read poetry in these languages, you find the great, the the, the extremely high level of beauty, of articulation. A a, a type of uh, a perfection almost uh, of expression, uh, and this is part of part of having ikhtha, part of having that is that you're able to be eloquent and beautiful in your speech and that you avoid ugliness. There are many art forms today, in our time today, which uh, are bereft of uh, beautiful speech. Uh, and that has, a, that has a big effect on people's character, a big effect on people's conduct. Uh, the type of speech we use, we internalize it. We internalize it and it becomes part of our, part of our character. Uh, if, if that also includes modesty and purity uh, to avoid indecency, and also it also includes things like uh, miseriness, lying and backfighting and other things. So, uh, so, so not having a sense of uh, of if, uh, in terms of being to, uh, being miserly. Imam Ibn Qayyim says that's part of uh, as part of uh, if. Uh, is that you are not miserly, you are generous, a generous person. And also that's a very important part of, of family life and home life is generosity. Generosity in your uh, conduct, generosity in your manners, generosity in your wealth, and to avoid things like backbiting and lying and these things. So to have a general sense of purity in character, a sense of uh, modesty, I am, right? And so the Prophet Ali Sallam he said that uh, if a person does not have haya, then let him do as he pleases, meaning that there is no there is no longer any boundaries. There's nothing there. There's no, nothing left to uh, restrict this person's behavior, restrict this person's character. Everything is uh, everything is open game. Right? Everything is open. You can do whatever you want. And uh, that sounds very familiar in our current moment, in our current moment, in our culture today, in our society today. There is obviously a lack of haya, but but look at how it manifests. It manifests in a way that you can, you just do as you please, and we'll come back uh, to this idea. Uh, third, he says is shuja, shuja. Uh, and he says this is cultivating self. Part of this is to cultivate self-respect. Self-respect, right? To have a sense of dignity, to have a sense of uh, nobility, that you are not just one is not a person like a doormat. That you know you can just be treated with uh, uh, with being humiliated, high manners. High level of manners, high level of virtue, generosity, nobility, to be selfless, to be selfless. Part of the ailment of our time today 
is the opposite of selflessness. It's selfishness. We live in a very individualistic world, a world which prioritizes the needs of the individual above everything else. So even above the needs of family, if a person, we often hear this, right? If you're, if, you know, people speak like, you know, if you're, if your mom, if your dad, someone like that, it's toxic or they're not doing what you want them to do. They're not uh, agreeing with you. Uh, then you're taught that, you know, you have to look out for your own well-being before uh, and, and leave these people alone and cancel them or get rid of them. Uh, and so it's the prioritization of the self over any uh, any other category, any other person, any other person in your life. Bravery, he includes bravery in Shuja. This is generally the meaning of, uh, of Shuja is uh, uh, a sense of bravery. Uh, and of course, again, to control anger. And he also includes the ability to take revenge, but not doing so. But a person has the ability to uh, extract revenge from another person. But out of their, out of this, this deep sense of shuja, of self-respect and virtue and manners and nobility, they leave it alone. And this is also Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he says in another place, in another uh, text, he says that uh, this is part of the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness, of his mercy. Is that Allah subhanahu like oftentimes people, we forgive others because we can't do anything about it sometimes. If if I if you harm me, if I harm you, there's nothing I can do sometimes. I'm the only option I have is okay, I'll I'll forgive. But if I had the option, if I had the opportunity, if I had the power to do something, maybe I wouldn't do it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He forgives despite his power, his qudra over punishing a person. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives any of us. So, so, so the, our forgiveness and our virtue in this regard is actually imperfect. Because sometimes we don't have the option to take revenge. And sometimes we want to. So people, sometimes they want to take revenge. They want to harm people who harm them. Sometimes you want to harm somebody that has brought harm to you or harm to your loved ones. You can't do anything. Your hands are tied. So part of shuja is that you uh, forgive and you uh, don't seek revenge when uh, you have the opportunity to do so. That's a greater level. And the last one, that the last pillar he cites is Adam, is to be, to, to be moderate and to be balanced, to be fair and to be just, and to take the right course of action between extremes. And we'll talk about this uh, as well. So, and then here, Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he says that Islam is another name. Islam is another name. This is what we spoke about. I alluded to this at the beginning. Islam is another name for good, for good akhlaq. Islam is another name for good akhlaq. And the reality of uh, the sawwuf, he says, is none other than perfecting good character. Thus, the degree to which one excels in beautiful character, he excels in deed. So he's totally combined. He said that the extent to which a person is a good Muslim, that is, it is the extent to which he has perfected his character. So if we look into ourselves and we see our character is lacking, that is the same degree to which our deen is lacking, our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is lacking. And he also cites some others, other people, he's, uh, other pious people of the past who said that the reality of good character is generosity, abstaining from harming others, bearing difficulties and abuse, to remain steadfast in good actions, abstaining from evil actions. So, So these are the four pillars that he uh, that he speaks about, and they have an inverse as well. They have an inverse uh, as well. Uh, 
So four pillars of bad akhlaq. Four pillars of bad akhlaq, which are the opposite of the first four that we that we saw. So the first is jahal. Jahal, he says, is inversing good and evil. And inversing imperfect and perfect. So, so what, what does he mean by this? He says that one an example of this is that a person is happy uh, at a time of anger when it is appropriate that he uh, be angry, he is happy. And when it is appropriate that he is angry, uh, that he is happy, he is angry. He inverses good and evil. He doesn't have a sense. He's ignorant, right? Jahal is ignorant, right? And he uh, and he turns these relationships, uh, th th these relations around. The second is dhun, to place a thing where it doesn't belong. That's a typo. It should be where it doesn't belong. To place a thing where it does not belong. Right. So uh, to be uh, uh, to be stingy at a time of generosity, he says. To be stingy at a time of generosity. And to be generous at a time in which you should probably hold back. So it's the opposite of Adal, right? Adal, he says, is balance, to be moderate, to be temperate, to be just, to be balanced. And so Dhulm is the opposite of Adal. Uh, another example he gives is uh, to be gentle at a time of when discipline is appropriate. Right? So think of think of your family, think of your children. Right? Sometimes uh, it is a time of discipline. And you should discipline your children, uh, but you end up being gentle. And it's the other way as well. Sometimes it's a time to be gentle with your children or gentle with the people in your home, but you end up being harsh. So this is uh, turning it around. This is this is oppression. Third is shahwa, uh, to be covetous, miserly, sinful. He also includes gluttonous. It's part of desire, right? Shahwa is desire, right? To fulfill your desire to, to, to covet things, right? To gather things, to collect. Uh, that's also one of the big ailments of our time is materialism. People love to have not only the best, but the highest quantity of the best. Right? Our homes are filled. All of our homes are filled. We have so many things, endless amount of things, and we buy endless amount of things for our children. So this is part of shahwa. This is one of the one of the pillars of bad akhlaq is that you uh, are materialistic in a sense. You know, at the core of materialism is, is the cultivation of desire, is to, to be desirous of so many things. So shahwa, to be gluttonous, right? food culture, eating too much. And the last one he says is, is ghadab, to be arrogant, to be jealous, to be foolish. It's part of anger. Right? When you become angry, you become foolish. You do foolish things. Uh, when you become angry, you're also prone to arrogance. And he says to become habituated into lowly character traits. And so, so part of what happens you know, with these pillars, right? They also lead to other types of lowly traits. So ghadab, this type of anger and, and jealousy and arrogance and foolishness, what it leads to, it leads to other types of uh, lowly character traits. So you become worse and worse uh, uh, over time. So so, so, so these are these are, I think, the uh, the broad uh, traits that we should avoid. These four and the other four, uh, we should uh, aim to cultivate in ourselves. And, and these are broad principles. Right? And you can look at them as broad categories. That all of good akhlaq, all of good manners, are summarized uh, in these traits. And there's there's so much more here uh, that you can go and read and look at um, later on uh, to. Um, to learn more about these. So, we take a few yes. Yes. Um, I'll begin with the first one. Are these four meant to be like any little things, writings, opposite of the other four? Like, is there a converse? 
Some of them look like they are. They are all of them. Uh, generally, uh, he 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 says that the uh, they are the inverse of these, but not all of them apply exactly. But um, but some of them definitely are like Zulm and Adel. Yeah, Zulm and Adel. Um, yeah, Shahua and Ifa are the opposite. Zabar and Jalal. Yeah, and Shuja and uh, Adab would also fit. Right. Uh, so to be to be to, so to have Shuja would mean to be brave and to not be vengeful, and Adab would be to be angry and to be vengeful, <clears throat> and to be foolish. Uh, Shuja would be to be intelligent and and. Uh, uh, you know, and, I mean, they also relate to one another, right? Like, so part of shuja is also part of uh, is also being adab, right? It's it's to take the right course of action at the right time. Right? So, so there's there's overlap within these categories, and then there are also the inverse of the others as well. Any other uh, thoughts? Yeah. Like, is this your own translation or uh, generally? Yeah. Yes. This is a uh, Madarij This is uh Madarij, but I took it from some another text. So I didn't. Uh, I took parts of it from Madarij, but I, I had another text. Yeah. Yes. Well, I had always seen some of this translated as like patience, and like a lot of the things that are described in there, um, I think fit that uh, umbrella. Mm -hmm. uh, I just thought that it was interesting that I didn't see. Patience as one of the translations that you decided on. But I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of that is having patience, yeah, right? Yeah. Like controlling anger is part of patience. Sustaining is causing uh, from other parts. Yeah. Having patience. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, we can repeat the question. Oh, yeah. The, 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 the question uh, is that uh, why isn't patience uh, part of the. Uh, although patience, the brother said, the patience encompasses all of these things, but uh, it's interesting to see that patience is not there. Yeah, like perseverance. When when you when you read the definition that uh, Imam Ibn Qayyim gives, uh, he speaks of like perseverance and control and, and these types of things. So uh, you know that would that, you're right. It broadly falls under uh, patience. But perseverance, I think, is uh, probably a, a more accurate uh, and you know, closer to what sabr is, right? To, to persevere. Yeah. Sisters. So, so uh, what what I, what I want to do is uh, look at uh, some of the um, points that were made in the book by uh, Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Buddha in, in Adab al Islam, um, and look at it through these categories. Right? So, cultivating ifa, right? Cultivating ifa, right? So, what did we say ifa was? Ifa is to avoid ugliness in speech and conduct. To have modesty and purity, to avoid indecency, miserliness. Right. So, so the first thing that uh, the Sheikh says in the book is that when you approach your ho own home or you enter your home, what is the adab of entering your home? So the first thing uh, he says is to that you should you ought to announce your presence right, and say salam. So salam is very important. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Afshu salam bainakum, spread salam between your amongst yourselves. And there's so many, there's so many narrations that I haven't included all of them uh, that the Shaykh mentioned in the book, and you can go and you can uh, uh, look at them and read them. Uh, Ibn, when Ibn Mas'ud would enter the home, he would make his presence known by speaking and raising his voice. Imam Ahmad, the great scholar, when a per said, when a person enters his house, he had to call or tap his shoes. And his son, Abdullah, said, my father would announce his arrival before entering by tapping his shoes. So part of cultivating this modesty, right? part of cultivating good, uh, a good sense of ifa is that you don't surprise people in the home. You allow them to prepare. Right? This is such a delicate thing, right? It's such a subtle thing that he's speaking about. Is that you don't know the conditions of your family when they're when when they're home. They they could you know they could be uh, busy cleaning or the house could be you know in a in a state that you, you don't like or it could be any number of things. Look at all of the 
types of the varieties of things that we see in, in our day-to-day -day lives. So many things can happen. So announcing yourself so as not to surprise others. This is cultivating a sense of modesty. And also people inside the home, sometimes there's guests, sometimes you know, people's homes are uh, not just you know nuclear families. Some, uh, most of the time people have parents who live at home and young children, grandparents, uh, sometimes other people. In fact, when you actually look back in, into Islamic history, a hundred years ago, there was all sorts of people that were part of the same home, distant uh, relatives and, uh, and, uh, and other types of relations. Uh, they would all be part of the part of the family, part of the home. And so it's very important that one announce themselves and to say salam uh, when entering the home. And the Prophet ﷺ forbade a person from unexpectedly surprising his family at night when travel when returning from travel. So this is the theme that you will see uh, as well all across. So when the Prophet ﷺ, he would say, when you return from travel, you should make an announcement, send a messenger that you know so and so has uh, that you know I've arrived, make preparations so that you know you 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 uh, you take you you take care of yourself uh, and you allow others uh, to prepare for you as well. So you know now obviously we don't send messengers, we send texts and phone calls and, and things like that. But that's uh, that's important. That's important to do. Uh, when entering a home. Uh, seek permission to enter. So this is obviously, uh, he's not just referring to our own homes, right? Uh, but if you visit someone's home, when you visit someone's home, you should uh, seek permission to enter. And also, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this uh, later on, is that when you, uh, you shouldn't just like swing doors open, even in your own home, even with your children. Uh, we'll see, uh, Abdullah ibn Omar, you, 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 you would not allow his ch children in their in their own home to just open the door, and he wouldn't do the same for his children, because you don't know what state you know a person is in. Uh, and look at this hadith, Imam Malik, uh, the great scholar, he reports that a man asked the Prophet ﷺ, "Should I seek permission to enter my mother's room?" And the Prophet ﷺ said, "Yes." Uh, and he said, "But we live together in the same house." So why do I still have to, you know, it's all the same. And, you know, and and, and keep in mind, you know, the, the types of houses and what rooms were uh, in the time of the Prophet and in the, in the time of Imam Malik. They were just, you know, very uh, basic structures, right? They weren't complicated, fancy homes, right? Uh, and the Prophet uh, he said to him, and this happened a few times, right? He kept asking why, why? And so the Prophet said that, you know, Seek her permission to enter because would you like to see her naked? Would you like to see her in a state in which she's not ready to receive? Because he kept asking. That's why the Prophet said something in, in a stark and kind of direct way. Uh, you know, you, you want to see her in, in that state? Of course you don't. So seek permission. That's better. Seek permission even inside your own home. If the door is closed uh, and it's apparent in there, especially if a parent uh, is in uh, the home and the doors are closed. Uh, seek permission before entering. This is part of, you know, uh, cultural modesty, and also part of, you know, part of good akhlaq is that we help one another in the cultivating of akhlaq. We help one another. So if you knock on the door and you seek permission from the one inside, you help yourself and you help them as well. Uh, when you, uh, when you, when you go to someone's house. When you when you visit somebody, right? again, I thought modesty, purity. Uh, the sheikh he says that we should control the gaze when seeking permission to enter someone's home and when inside the home. So when you go to somebody's house, you know, I guess people have a tendency to like start looking in the back, what's going on, what's happening in the kitchen, is the food ready? And you know, sometimes there's uh, women and you know elderly and other people who. Uh, you know, who are kind of in the private part of the uh, of the house, and so part of modesty is that you lower lower your gaze. Of course, we find this in the Quran right? to lower your gaze, to have purity and modesty in the way that you conduct and the way that you carry yourself. So when you enter someone's home, first you ask for permission: Can I come in? May I come in? Uh, and 
and you don't just start looking around everywhere. Uh, and 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 this and, and and look at this hadith. A man came to seek permission to enter the house of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was facing the door. He was just like directly in front of the door. And so the Prophet turned turned him uh, in a different direction. He said, "No, you should look over there." Uh, and he and he ordered him to move away from the door. Uh, and he's and he said the act of asking permission has actually been ordained to prevent intrusion. Right. So, uh, so part of the other of uh, visiting someone's home is that when you ring the bell, you should step back and not just stand directly in front of the door. Because when they open it, you know, you'll probably be able to see you. it's uncomfortable. So you should step back and turn away and look to the other way. So when they enter the home, so when they open the door, you're ready to, they're ready to welcome you. They're ready to receive you. You know, these are such subtle things, but they, but they speak about what it means to develop, what it means to cultivate and think about modesty, purity. I thought this is this is this is where it's coming from. It's these subtle uh, acts, subtle ways of behavior, of comportment, of other comportment, comporting yourself in these in these subtle ways to take care of others, to take care of other people, to keep mindful of. Uh, their homes, their condition, their states. It's also forbidden to look inside, you know, to peep inside people's homes. Again, this is part of, you know, like, uh, of not being modest. People are in a different state when they're at home, when they're at home. Right? People wear different types of clothes. They, they behave differently from when they're in public. They're much more relaxed. And so to look inside people's homes when they're in a private state, this is a breach of uh, trust. It's a it's a big thing. And look at what the Prophet Sallallahu said here. He said that a man was peeping through a hole into the room of the Prophet Sallallahu while he was combing his hair. And the Prophet Sallallahu he saw him, saw him while he was doing this. And he and the Prophet Sallallahu said, had I known that you were looking, I would have poked your eye out with this comb. Right? You poked your eye out for for, for violating. Uh, someone's private space. Right? So the Prophet says, and, so, and so I seek permission. I seek permission when entering. And don't spy and look in, into people's homes. Yes. I'm sorry? Yes. I think you are in Yes. read that Yes. in the Messiah here. And people can take a literal meaning from it. Definitely, Allah so doesn't mean that. Yes. Yes. I already knew it. But people read it that way. Yes. What is that? How are you going to explain it? I ask the person, how do you explain this? He has no explanation. Yes. It doesn't mean you actually poke it. Yes. It, it's very serious to poke somebody's eye. Yes. You're gone. Yes. Yeah. No, I, uh, 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 Uncle put, uh, brings up a very important point. Is that, does the Prophet so actually mean this literally? Um, and uh, my my guess would be the process of is not literally uh, seeing this literally yeah. that uh, you know we should start you know uh, harming people in this way a serious <laughs> serious injury to someone poking their eye out right? uh, but um, uh, what does it mean and how, what is what is the application I think in a general sense we can say uh, that you know it's a it, it, it uh, requires a serious reaction right it requires a serious sort of um, uh, reaction against the person who is violating in this way. Um, so we can say it like that, it, it, you know, uh, uh, other people, Sheikh Abu Zayd, they can probably give us a better sense of what exactly the process of, uh, meant and how we exactly we should apply this. But in a general sense, I think the message uh, message is received. It's just like that, at least you're going to take your stick out to discipline your children. Mm -hmm. And here, in the, the, the Kari, he hang up the student just coming a little late and beating up to death. Yes. From he is a religious scholar teaching again. Oh, they that's what they get education from me. They, 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 they don't use so uh so this is exactly why Ibn Qayyim Rahimullah is speaking of you know these four pillars, right? Is that because they they, they require a person to think and to use his reason and to is use his intellect and to 
uh, be fair and balanced and do the appropriate thing. So much of, of, of these things is to, to do the appropriate thing at the right time, to do the appropriate thing at the appropriate time. So, you know, in Nukrain, he said, he gives the example that uh, violating uh, Adil is that you discipline someone when it's time to be gentle with them. Right. And when it's time to be dis disciplinary with them, that you be gentle. You inverse it because you don't have good sense. You don't have good sense of what to do at the right time. Doing the right thing at the right time. But this requires wisdom. Right? And so, you know, and you're right. Uh, so, many, so, so, so many of the times we, 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 we lack this. And I think that you know, uh, this is why reflecting on thinking about and reading and studying uh, and cultivating these practices is so important because it, it allows us to peek into wisdom, gives us an insight into how to act, how to behave uh, in a wise way. So sometimes, you know, if someone is peeking in your home, you know, uh, maybe it's maybe it's sometimes in some cases, don't yell at them, right? or don't poke their eye out. Right? Maybe it's an opportunity to, to teach them. Maybe they don't know. Sometimes children do that. You know, children are very curious. So, uh, so you know, applying, applying, um, you know, in our daily lives in a balanced, wise way uh, requires so much. It requires a great deal. And uh, you actually learn uh, with experience. You learn these things with experience and age as you get older. This is why, there, as we'll get to, there's so much adab and respect for the elderly, the people who are older, uh, because they have the experience, they have that wisdom. That wisdom has come through decades and decades of going through all of the ups and the downs of life and going through all of the failings of life from being young and newly married to having small children, older children, and then those children marrying and then grandchildren and, and, and loss of life and family members. So much happens in the course of a life uh, that, uh, and, and that's wisdom for, for us to benefit from. Um, but also, again, in our culture today, um, we don't value uh, the uh, elder, the elderly people. We don't value them as much as we should. Uh, and especially in American culture, in our culture, at least, we we still have a great deal of that. But in our broader society, uh, you know, the way people look at you know the elderly, the, the way they approach them, you'll see it in movies and and shows. You know, they, they look at elderly as, oh, well, there's just bumbling fools. You know, they kind of lost the last marble and they're just like, you know, bumbling around and they just, you know, put them away somewhere and uh, out of sight, out of mind. That's the general attitude uh, that people have. Um, and it's, it's, it's to our own detriment. So um, another aspect of Ifa in the home is to remove your shoes. Right? I think we all do this, right? And, uh, in, in American culture, I think we've all had the experience of going to a non-Muslim's house uh, and everyone's walking around with shoes. It's just so shocking, right? Uh, but yeah, you know, uh, to remove your shoes, obviously, um, uh, lowering the eyes, lowering the voice, purity, cultivating the purity. And also uh, the Sheikh mentions that don't inspect people's homes, right? Don't inspect people. When you go to somebody's house, don't start looking around in their private things and opening up their cabinets and their, you know, closets and you know, going around uh, these things, right? So Sheikh Abdul Fattah Buddha he writes, when you enter the home of your brother or friend, whether as a visitor or an overnight guest, do not closely examine its contents as an inspector would. Limit your gaze uh, during your stay to what you need. Do not open closet or boxes. Do not inspect a wallet a package or a covered object. Uh, this is against Islamic manners and it is impolite betrayal of the trust your host has accorded to you by allowing you to enter his home and reside there. So be polite for this, uh, for this would cultivate love and respect for you in the heart of your host. Right? So uh, part of good adab is uh, to keep maintaining the trust of other people. Right, so people. Uh, so when someone enters your home, this is based on trust. Right, so it's something that we know about this person is a trustworthy, gentle person, uh, respectable person, and so we allow them into our home, and so they ought not to violate, um, violate that. Um, so, other aspects of uh, visiting and uh, visiting homes. Uh, he, spe uh, he speaks a lot about you know visiting homes, but we can apply this also. 
uh, uh, more broadly as well. Um, it's to time time visit time your visits, time your visits, right? So you know, just using you know good sense, time your visit. Don't show up to somebody's house uh, at an inappropriate time. You know, don't go at six a.m., five a.m. when everyone's asleep or something like that, or late at night when people are sleeping or at dinner, meal times, dinner dinner times, uh, and other times. Uh, and Sheikh says, choose an appropriate time for your visit. Do not visit at inconvenient times, such as meal time, or when people are sleeping, resting, or relaxing. The length of your visit should be in accordance with your relationship with your host. Right? So this is also practicing good adan, right? Good, good sense, right? To be uh, to not be so excessive, to understand the type of relationship that you have. This is the person you've grown up with. This is your a childhood friend. It's a, it, there's a different sense of visiting homes, and this is a person the first time you met that person. So in accordance with uh, the, the type of relationship that you have with that person, as well as in accordance to their circumstances and their conditions, and do not overstay. Do not overstay your welcome by making your visit too long or too burdensome. Right? So uh, just to be mindful and careful about visiting one another and going into people's homes uh, the way that we uh, should be. Um, when entering, again, to have this type of uh, uh, virtue is um, how to knock, how to knock. So the shaykh says, don't knock like a thug. I don't bang on the door, bang. I don't do that, right? Gently, gently, right? The, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sahaba, they would knock on the door of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with their fingertips, just in a light, gentle way, not you know, rapping on the door so hard because people become startled right? and, and, and afraid what's going on. Right? So this is what happened to Imam Ahmed. A woman came to ask him a question about you know something related to the deen, some like fifty question or something, and she just was banging on his door, and he came out startled and he said, "This is how this is the banging of a policeman. When 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 the police come and they break down your door in the middle of the night and they arrest you, you know we've all we've all seen those scenes. Uh, they just you know bump, you know bash their way in. So this is this is what you're doing. Relax. It's not how you approach somebody's home." Um, so, so knock, he says, knock at the door in a pleasant way, which is sufficient to make your presence known. Right? So just let in, uh, the Sahaba would just do it with their, with their fingertips. fingertips. Uh, nowadays we have, uh, sorry, fingernails, not fingertips. Um, uh, nowadays we have bells, right? We have bells. So, um, you know, don't, don't be too heavy on the bell. It was one time or two times maybe. And so one of the things the Shaykh mentioned was the time in between the knocking. Right. So he said some of the ulama, they used to say that the time in between the knock should be the time it takes for a person to complete four accounts of prayer. Right. So you do one knock and then you just wait. <laughs> you wait until they uh, do four accounts and then you knock again. Right. Uh, and if they uh, don't answer, then you should leave. Right. And so uh, sometimes people, they, they become uh, angry or they become upset because they say, oh, and open the door, you know, and uh, or they ask me to, you know, right now is not appropriate. So it, it harms their sense of uh, self-respect. Right? And so part of shuja, part of you know, cultivating this nobility is that you don't take it uh, again, like you don't you don't take it uh, um, against you know against yourself, like against your sense of self-respect. Right. So so just leave, uh, leave if no one answers, um, and don't be so, uh, don't take offense to it. I don't take offense to it. Um, uh, uh, also, part of shuja is the Prophet, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said that when uh, someone uh, knocks on the door and they say, "Who, who is it?" Don't say it's me. Right? Don't say it's me. Right? Who is it? Me. Right? We don't know who me is, right? So, you know, so, so the Shaykh he said he writes, "When you visit a friend of yours with or without an appointment, and he apologizes for not being able to receive you." Oh, I'm sorry, this is from the previous point. Except his apology, his personal affairs and the condition of his of his house are best known uh, to him. So, so anyway, so uh, Jabir of the Allah one, he says in this hadith that he went to the house of the Prophet and he knocked, and the Prophet said, Who is it? And he said, It's me. And so the Prophet, he disapprovingly, he said, Is it me? Is it me? You know, just, you know, who is this me? What, what me are you speaking about? 
right? So, so the Sahaba they would mention their names. They would say like, you know, this is Abu Bakr, this is Omar. Right? Uh, they would they would say their names. And so this is just you know taking care of uh, uh, other people. Um, uh, and yeah, I I, I, uh, I was as I was mentioning before, don't be upset if you are refused. Right? When you knock and someone says, you know, who is it? And you say it's me, and they say, oh no, I can't see you. So don't be, don't be, don't be upset about that. Uh, do not remain at the door of those who decline your visit. You do have other needs to attend to, right? So Patada, this is the famous Taber, he's saying you have other needs to attend to. So like, do do other things. Go and finish your other work. Don't take it. Uh, don't be don't be offended by it. Right? You have other needs um, to attend, and they're out there. They're busy. They're already occupied. Therefore, they deserve to be excused. And sometimes, and 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 the Sheikh Sheikh Abu Fatah, he, 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 in this section, he was mentioning that sometimes that you should have such a high level of shuja. He doesn't say you should have a high level of shuja, but this is my categorization. But you should have such a high level of shuja, this this nobility in your character, that when someone says they can't see you, uh, you should readily accept it. Say, oh no, no worries. Why? Because, because if you make it difficult for them, sometimes they resort to lying, which is which is hard. It's a sin to lie, right? Of course, we all know this. But sometimes when you uh, pester somebody, uh, you know, trying to force your way in, uh, people sometimes lie about why they can't see you. They'll make something up. So to help foster virtue in others is is also an, an act of shujaan. Right? Is that you're not only just cultivating this in yourself, but you're allowing an opportunity for other people to develop it and foster it and to cultivate it as well. And that you're not burning somebody to such a degree that they have they're forced to uh, to lie or to say something wrong uh, to get out of you know out of out of this meeting. Right? So what uh, I mean, I'm just I'm just struck by the look at the attention to the detail in. Daily uh, meetings. This is this is this is it's so subtle. It's so delicate. It's so uh, you know. It's so um, I can't find the word. It's so subtle. Subtle is probably the best word. Under it's such a subtle understanding of of good character. What good character is? It's such a refined and a very high and noble understanding of what good character is. It's extremely beautiful. Understanding of good character. Uh, yes. Interesting term that nowadays you can text it, you can already tell them in advance that I'm coming in this and that time. But even back home in any country, people living in villages, they can go to another village for two, three miles, uh, two, three hours of walking. There's no way they can tell it unless they write on a letter. So we take on so many days. And we travel about two, three, four hours in hard weather, cold weather. Mm -hmm. We knock at the door, he said, I cannot see you. Yeah. What do you mean? We sometimes, just yeah. like scholar, I, we have seen, yeah. we have listened to these uh, adult um, scholars. So scholars cannot elaborate to present situation in certain situation. Just like uh, you just mentioned about the shoes, take out the shoes. We take out the shoes, Chinese take out the shoes. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the Indian Gujarati take out the shoes. Mm -hmm. It's very common in certain. But uh, why these people don't take out the shoes? It's not because they are unrespectful. Yes, you can get hurt that so many things in the office, you can get hurt very badly. We keep the shoes up, even just to standing by your by your bed, the the lack of the bed it feels so bad. And it is very serious yes. injuries. Especially on the tip of the of the, yeah, the toes. The toes, yes. So yes. it has to be a little relevant. So, but the, so so I, I would say so 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 the uncle was asking about well you know how do we apply uh, you know these virtues and these hadith and this way of conducting yourself in our time today and I think this is why I categorize uh, this in the four pillars right so of course you know. You know, as in different cultures and different times and different places, there's different ways. You know, different ways come about. So this is why it's good to speak of you know a broad category like shujaan, right? To or adil, right? To to not be excessive. 
So you figure out what is excessive and what is not excessive based on the understanding that you have of your own culture today, of your based on your own time and place today. This is why you know the scholars of the past they had much broader vision. They understood how to categorize things in, in very helpful ways. So uh, you know we can apply it in our own times based on our own kind of sort of common sense and our understanding of our culture and our society. Uh, you know now like you, the example that you mentioned about you know back in uh, you know 50 years ago people would travel hours and hours. And then you know the, the host wouldn't know they're coming, and they would knock on the door. And what if that person can't see them? It's such a great uh, inconvenience, of course. And now we have texting and all sorts of things. But even uh, people who text and these things, uh, there's there there uh, there are ways in which we can practice shuja and adil and all of these things in our modern practices uh, of texting. Uh, so people, there's a there's a general sort of understanding of what is a good text, what is a respectful text. Uh, you know, some of the, the young, the younger kids, they, 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 they probably know better than me. Um, so there, so that we do have these uh, manners and these things. But I think the key thing is, is that we prioritize the virtues, right? We prioritize the pillars of good akhlaq and to learn them well and to cultivate them and then apply them with wisdom and understanding in our own particular context. So we can't speak of every single context that we will come across. But to have a general understanding, I think is a, I think is a good idea. So um, you know, uh, to keep that in mind, uh, is, is, is that is that is that helpful, or, or am I skirting the question? Skirting <laughs> 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 well, uh, this. Uh, well, you know, even in a colder time, there are no carpets and it's uh, dirty floors. Uh, why do you take the shoes off? I mean, you know, when you walk around outside, the shoe, shoes will get dirty. From uh, you know, the bottom of the shoes are dirty. So if you walk in with dirty shoes in your house on the carpet, most people have carpets. So white carpet. So so dust and dirt and grime and everything outside, it will get on your carpet. So that that's very. No, here it's dirty, but I'm saying uh, back home, if I don't have a carpet, that floors are dirty. Mm -hmm. Why do you take your shoes out? Shoes out and so, you so so so, so what I've seen is people have different shoes for the house. Here is a different shoe in the house. Yeah. In the house, you always have a shoe that is just toes are covered. Mm. That is protected. Mm. And those shoes are different. Mm. So when the people just only, only come for one or two minutes, they don't take the shoes up. It's too hard to take the shoes up. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And when they're in the home, they use other shoes, which we normally don't use because they are used to be barefoot. And that's yeah. we get hurt our foot every other day. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the foot, you know, stubbing your toe, I don't know. That's a hard one to solve, right? Because why it is? Because at that time, there were not so much furniture thing in the home. And now our every room is loaded with things where you can hit it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these, these, I mean, you know, these, these are enduring enduring problems that uh, over time we have to uh, solve yeah. through our practices. Right? So there, there's not like ready-made answers for these things in our experience. And over time, we kind of uh, figure it out. So, uh, also part of shuja, moving on, uh, that high manners is obviously to be quiet when others uh, are sleeping, right? If you get into the shaykh, he writes, if you enter a place where people are asleep, whether at night or during the day, be quiet and be gentle, be considerate, do not cause any undue noise when entering or exiting. So, you know, sort of common sense. There's, there's memes like on the internet I've seen of uh, the, 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 they say that you know when my parents are asleep and there's a kid he's like walking so gingerly closing every you know cabinet softly and you know so not to wake up the parents but then the opposite when the parent when the child is asleep and the parents are awake they're vacuuming and va closing everything really hard so the kids so the kids are saying you know what's going on why aren't the parents respecting our sleep right so you know, you'll find this on the internet everywhere so. Uh, in fact, you know, so many of the reports from the Sahaba and from the Prophet, it goes both ways, right? So, so parents should also be mindful when their children are asleep uh, and not to start vacuuming right next to them. <laughs> but uh, kids should be patient if that happens. Uh, okay, so, uh, so other things, I want to be mindful of the time. It's 12.20. So um, we'll go through these quickly. Uh, so he also said, when you go to someone's home, don't whisper in a gathering. 
the, especially if there's like two people or three three people, then don't start whispering to the next one. Don't speak in a language the other one doesn't understand. If you're sitting between a tight in a tight space between two people, don't sit cross-legged. And so the Shaykh said that one of the most unfair things a person can, person can do is in a tight space between two people, he sits cross-legged. Right. So you should, you know, uh, you know, be mindful of, uh, of others. Uh, don't eavesdrop in conversations, especially when you uh, visit people's homes. Don't eavesdrop on what other people are doing. Uh, there's a very uh, scary hadith about this process. I've said, whoever listens to people's conversations against their wishes will be punished by molten lead being poured down their ears this is Sahih Bukhari, uh, on the Day of Judgment. All right, so, um, getting to the elderly very quickly, uh, the Prophet uh, advised us that when you meet people, when you greet people, when you go into uh, the home, always start with the elderly first. Greet people who are uh, elders, seniors, people of advanced age and knowledge and wisdom and understanding. Prioritize them always first. When you're sitting and having meals, the Prophet, the Sahaba said they would say when we would eat with the Prophet, we would never reach for the food first. So many young kids don't understand this anymore. They sit at the table and the youngest kid is just going and, and you, know, you have to wait until the, the eldest person or if there's a guest, you know, the guest or a scholar or some noble person is there. Uh, you wait for them to have food first. You greet them first. You honor them first. Uh, and a very beautiful narration from um, uh, a scholar who was walking with his teacher, Qadi Abu Yala, who was a great company scholar. Uh, he said, um, if you were walking with someone you honor, someone who was noble, an elderly person, where would you walk? And the person the, and his student said, I don't know. Uh, he said, walk to his right, walk on his right side, stay behind, place him, uh, stay, walk a little behind him, a step behind him, keep him in front of you. When you pray, put him in a place and make him your imam. Don't leave the prayer, make him leave the prayer, give him that honor and that respect. Uh, and leave his left side clear. Don't walk on his left side, walk on his right side because uh, he may need to spit or to get rid of dirt. Um, and, and so so be, be, be mindful of the uh, elderly and how you interact with them. Right? So one of the interesting things he says here is that walk on his right side, not on his left side. So the left side, as we know, we, you know we, we, we use the bathroom with our left hand and with our right hand. So there is this right and left uh, dichotomy that we have. Right is for good things and left is for bad things, right? Uh, and so, so so, the left, don't walk on people's left-hand side because that's the side if they have to spit or to, you know, clean themselves or rub some dirt off of them, that's the side they're going to do it on. And so allowing them the space to uh, to take care of their any needs that might come up as you're walking around outside. So again, such a fine point, subtle point. We don't I've never thought about which side of the person I should walk on. We just do it based on, you know, uh, some arbitrary kind of judgment. But even some, something like this, uh, they were thinking about. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll move through this quickly, allow the host to seat you, stay in appropriate time to discuss this. Um, if you're the youngest in a gathering, Sheikh Abdul Fattah says, then you should not be speaking. If you're the youngest person in the, in the gathering, don't talk. Unless you unless you know that what you have, what you say what you what you're going to say is going to be effective, if not, then just remain quiet. Let the elders talk. Right? Um, so it's something for young people to think about. Uh, uh, and then again, the order of the greeting of greeting people, of welcoming people in your home, or when you uh, visit people, age, right? age, age is a huge thing. The Prophet Sallam said, "Those who don't respect their elders, they're not from amongst us." Right. And those who don't, uh, no, 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 it, it, it's not to be taken so literally. You know, if there's a child coming, obviously, you're not going to just you know, do something to the kid to push him away to the side, but you know, in a, in a kind of wise it way, you know, of course, you know, you would acknowledge the child, but you know, your ultimate attention and focus is on you know, uh, the elderly. So, so people who have advanced age, knowledge. And he also includes social status, uh, which we can speak of um, in, the, in the questions. Lineage, leadership, generosity, these traits that, you know, in, by which people excel others, uh, they, um, 
they should be uh, prioritized in that in that way. So anyway, uh, I know we're getting very close to the end of our time. Uh, I wanted to uh, just mention something about one example of um, ethics that come out of uh, the Western world. Um, very famous philosopher from Germany. His name was Frederick Nietzsche. He died in the year 1900. Uh, he uh, developed um, a, a, a system of ethics, uh, which I think the reason I chose him is because I think it's very um, it's very appropriate for our time today. I think most people in our world today and all the issues that we, we're seeing today and the challenges that we have as Muslims, I think are probably coming from him than others in the West. So in, in, in the Western, uh, in Western thought, there are many types of approaches to ethics. Uh, some are you know, a lot like ours and, and, and some are not, but uh, I think this is a good example. So just very quickly, I wanna share with you with the origins. Ethics, where, the eth where do ethics come from, according to this philosopher uh, called Nietzsche? So he says, now for me, it is obvious that the real breeding ground for the concept of good has been sought and located in the wrong place by this theory. The judgment, good, does not emanate from those to whom goodness is shown. Instead, it has been the good themselves, meaning the noble, the mighty, the high-placed, and the high-minded, who saw and judged themselves and their actions as good. I mean, first rate, in contrast to everything lowly, low-minded, common, and plebeian. So the first thing that he says is that where do ethics come from? They come from the nobility, from people who are aristocrats, people who are high in high places. And, and, and he says that everything that they consider to be good becomes good because they're noble people, they're aristocratic people, they're intelligent people, they're cultured, they're sophisticated. So whatever they deem to be good, that's what's good. And whatever they deem to be beneath them, to be uh, uh, lower than them, then that is, that's what's bad, that's evil. So good akhlaq is the akhlaq of uh, noble, aristocratic, good people. That's what, he, that, that, that's what he's saying here. So this is where he says the origins of, uh, of ethics, of good manners, of good akhlaq. And for him, the, the most noblest people were the Greeks. The Greeks were the most noblest people. Um, and he says, what happened? What happened in the Western world? Uh, how did we lose that, that Greek nobility, that air of aristocracy, that uh, those high-minded high -minded, uh, uh, ethics and virtues that we had that came out of powerful, rich people? But he said it was the Jews who rejected the aristocratic value equation. The equation is good equals noble equals powerful. That's power, right? Power, whoever has power is the one who decides what is good. That's what he's saying. Beautiful, happy, and blessed. Ventured with awe-inspiring consistency to bring about a reversal and held it in the teeth of the most unfathomable hatred, the hatred of the power of the saying, only those who suffer are good. Only the poor, the powerless, the lowly are good. The suffering, the deprived, the sick, the ugly are the only pious people. And the only ones saved, salvation is for them alone. Whereas you rich, the noble and powerful, you are eternally wicked, cruel, lustful, insatiate, godless. You will also be eternally wretched, cursed, and damned. We who became heir to this Jewish revaluation with regard to the huge and incalculably disastrous initiative taken by the Jews with the most fundamental of all declarations of war, I recall the words I wrote on another occasion, namely that the slaves' revolt in morality begins with the Jews, a revolt which has 2,000 years of history behind it and which has only been lost sight of because it was victorious. So what is he saying? He is saying here that the ethics that the modern world has, it comes out of this Jewish and Christian tradition, which made the, uh, the people who suffered and the weakness, they made that nobility. What is good? The good are those who suffer, right? Because the Jews, they were in prison, right? So, so the, he, this philosopher he's saying is that the way that the Jews and the Christians, they fought against their oppressors was by making oppression a good thing. They said, oh, those who suffer are good. Those who uh, are poor, they're good. Those who don't have power, that's what virtue is. So to be meek and to be humble and to be oppressed and to be uh, de deprived and sick, all these lowly things he is saying, 
that's actually, they, twi they turned it around. First, it was these noble aristocratic um, virtues that were supposed to be the good, but these people, these religious people, they turned it around and they said, no, only the opposite of nobility, the opposite of those high-minded aristocratic virtues, that's actually uh, what is good. So part of what he is saying here is that he's saying that where does good come from? It comes from a point in history, from, so, from aristocratic people. So good and evil are historically contingent. That's the first thing he's saying about ethics, is that they're, they, they, are come, they emerge only out of the conditions that we find throughout time. They don't have any universal value. They are not coming from some eternal divine source. These are just, as time happens, people who became rich and powerful, they decided what is good. The people who were poor and weak, they said, no, being poor and weak is good. So these are just contingent things. These are relative things. Ethics, good, bad, all these things that you speak about, these are just relative. They have no real value in and of themselves. That's what he's saying. And he says that the main culprit of this is Christianity. It's because they created a whole theology around suffering, the suffering of Christ on the cross, the death of you know, God, as the Christians say. And so they created this weakness. And so this philosopher, he, he vilifies Christianity. And, you know, Iqbal, Lama Iqbal, the famous Muslim uh, philosopher and poet, about Nietzsche, he said that Nietzsche drived a deep dagger into the heart of European thought. Uh, and, you know, part of this and, and so many other things that he wrote, he was criticizing the West. Excuse me, he was criticizing the West. He was criticizing Europe. He was criticizing Western civilization. And he was criticizing Christianity and, and, and religion as a whole, although he respected Islam. But he was criticizing Christianity and religion as a whole, that this is the reason why uh, Europe is in the state that, that, that it's in. It's just praises weakness and, and thinks that this is ethics. This is, this is not ethics. So Iqbal said about Nietzsche, very, uh, I came across this, I was uh, looking at Iqbal the other day. Uh, he says in, in Persian, he says, Qalbe u mumin as, but the ma'ash kafir as, which means that Nietzsche, his heart was a believer. Nietzsche was a famous atheist. Iqbal says about him, his heart was that of a believer, but his brain was a kafir. So this is Iqbal. So Iqbal, uh, he, uh, he saw in Nietzsche's critique of the West and, and critique of all of where these ethics come from, he saw in it something uh, which was um, really valuable. But the point is, is that Nietzsche is saying, and the philosophy that we have today, what we are living with today, where, what is our understanding of ethics and morality and goodness? Create your own. What you do, what you think, that's what's good. Right? And so Nietzsche says, will to power, right? Human beings have this desire for this power and this authority, and they can create a world. Right? And Iqbal speaks of that as well, but in a different sense. So, so the place of ethics and, and good and, and good and bad in our contemporary world, in our current moment, really is very, uh, it, it really you can uh, draw it back to uh, this German philosopher Nietzsche, who is basically saying all of these things, they're just culture, they're, uh, they're uh, uh, historically contingent, they're relative. People have made them up as they go along. We can do new other things. We can create new ethics. So ultimately, the center where ethics emerge from is the human being. But for us, we know that uh, this is wrong. This is incorrect. And, and this is the this is I think at the heart of all of the social problems that we see uh, that we see today. So uh, just to end very quickly, what is the ultimate goal of Allah uh, in Islam? So we can look very quickly at Shawaliullah uh, of uh, Shawaliullah Dehlawi, who died in 1762, was a great scholar of the Indian subcontinent. Um, and he said that the ultimate goal of defining character is Sa'ada. Is Sa'ada. And Imam Ghazali speaks about Sa'ada as well, which is ultimate felicity, all ultimate happiness. And it's by uh, true felicity, Sa'ada is the guiding of the animalistic part of the ruh by the rational soul. The compliance of the passions with sound reason, the rational soul vanquishing the animalistic, and reason being dominant over passions. So the first thing he says, what leads to sa'ada, what leads to this ultimate happiness, is that your intellect, your, your aqad, your reason, controls and dominates your passions and your desires. And he says, 
submission and animal and the animalistic part of the ruh uh, to the angelic part of the ruh. This is called acts. This is called acts of worship and religious exercises. So he says that those uh, the way that a person submits his animal side is is desirous, his passionate side of his of his ruh to his more angelic side is through worship, is through ibadah, is through obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says the investigation of this point goes back to the fact that true felicity is not ensnared except through acts of worship. And so sa'ada, ultimate happiness, only is encompassed, only is ensnared, he says, uh, around acts of worship, through, sorry, through acts of worship. And when human beings are sound, right, they're salim, qalbun salim, they yearn for this ultimate felicity and are attracted to it as iron is attracted to a magnet. This is the innate character according to which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created man and the fitrah according to which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constituted human beings. So what he's saying is that the, the way that Allah created human beings is they human beings, they seek out and they desire something that will perfect their character. So perfecting good character is tied directly and in a very deep way to human nature. So it's not like what Nietzsche is saying. Nietzsche is saying, oh, this is just relative, right? It just comes out as a result of different conditions in time. Sha'awaliullah is saying, no, this is a fundamental part of the human, uh, of the way that Allah created the human being. Is that the human being, he flocks to refinement of character. He flocks to this ultimate felicity through worship, through obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way a magnet is attracted, uh, the metal is attracted to a magnet. It's a fundamental part of the human of human nature. And if it's a, somehow separated from human nature, if this is somehow uh, 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 delinked from our nature, that ethics is something that we don't care about, we don't need, it's all relative, we can do whatever we want, it brings about the opposite of felicity, brings about the op opposite of sa'ada, which is, you can call it depression, anxiety, all so many modern ills that we find is because we're doing something that is fundamentally against our human nature, against our fitrah. So this is what Sha'awati Allah Ta'ala is saying. Therefore, there, had, there has been no nation possessing balanced temperaments among humankind, which does not have among it a group of great people who have given importance to the perfection of this innate character and consider it to be ultimate, the ultimate facility. So refining the soul is an innate human need. Human beings desire, they, we need to be ethical, to be good, to have akhlaq, to cultivate akhlaq, to have uh, good ethics and good manners. Akhlaq are not relative. Ethics are not something that is historically contingent. Um, and how is it done? It's done through, as Shawadi Allah says, through acts of worship and obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And refinement of character through obedience, it leads to sa'ada. It leads to this ultimate felicity. And, and we started, we come back to where we started. The ultimate aim of the deen, the ultimate aim of Islam, the ultimate aim of revelation, the reason why the Prophet was sent in the first place is to foster good akhlaq, because that's how Allah created us. That is Allah's intent for us. Allah created us so that we can become refined people. And we become refined in all of the details. For example, today we covered the details of the homes, visiting people and entering the homes and being with your family members in this way. That's just one small facet of the overall picture of developing and fostering and cultivating good akhlaq. Because that's that's the reason why Allah created us. That's what Shawar Yuh was saying. That's why, that's why Allah created us. And that's why Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim he said in the beginning that good character is another name for Islam. Islam, by another name, is good character. The Sawaf, by another name, is good character. Sa'ad, this ultimate felicity, this ultimate happiness, is a reference to Jannah. There's a reference to having to come in Allah, to being close with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in paradise, and to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah on the day of judgment. That's, that's the peak. That's the pinnacle. How do you get there? Refinement of character. So, you can get a sense of what our our tradition, our deen is telling us about character, about akhlaq, about ethics, and the way to get there, and what it means for the human being. It's a central part, fundamental part of human nature, of the human fitrah. And we can see also what our 
uh, Western um, uh, person is saying, Western philosopher, Nietzsche is saying, it's relative, it's ethics, build your own, do your own thing. Right. And, and by the way, Nietzsche is a very complicated figure, so I don't, I don't, uh, I want you to, you know, walk away with just that. But that's the core of it, and that's what we see. To I think what what he is speaking about is what we we really see that manifestation taking place in our society today. So the refinement of good character is not a trivial thing. It's not something on the side. That's the very heart and, and core of uh, our deen. So may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala give you and tawfiq to work hard and to develop uh, good character and good akhlaq and to give us deep understanding. I mean, we can do some questions right now. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a question or a it seems like he was criticizing the Judeo-Christian tradition yes. for being relative. But then I think I heard you say that that was also his conclusion that figured out their own and it was relative. No, he was not criticizing them for being relative. That's his understanding of the way ethics developed. He's saying that they developed ethics because they just turned the tables on the rich and the powerful by saying that no, 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 it's what is ethics, what is what what it means to be good is that we be, we suffer. Right? So, so that's his understanding of how ethics developed according to them. So they developed an ethics of weakness, of suffering. So this is what, this is what he's saying. But what is the point of, like, why is he saying that? The, the details aren't that important of what he means. He, what he's saying is that ethics is a result of human uh, choices. It's a result of, it's historically contingent factor. These things happen in time. They've been happening for 2,000 years. They won. That's what he's saying, right? So what, what, what was ethics before them? It was the Greeks, right? It was the people of noble virtue. So why were they noble? Because they called things that they did noble. That's what noble is. That's what good is. What is good? If you're an aristocratic person, you come from a high family, you have wealth, you have status, social status, whatever you call good, that will become good because you're powerful. You're in that position. And someone who is lowly a slave or something like that, you know, they by default become evil, they become bad. So he's saying that these things are historically, they, they, they function historically. There is no ultimate, you know, uh, source of where ethics uh, come from. They have nothing to do with your nature. These are just things people have created. That's what he's saying. Is that clear? So, so where's the, so uh, in Islam, we're saying the, you're saying something completely different. You're saying, no. This is not, it's part of human nature. Allah sent revelation for this. Allah created us in this way so that we can refine ourselves, so that we can get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he sent revelation. He told us how to do it. It's totally different. It's not relative. It's not historically connected. This is universal. Something that will stand for time and memorial. If what's right today, what is ethical today, what is good today, will be good tomorrow. And good 100 years from now. And it was good yesterday as well. So this is universal. So, so in, in our time today, what's good today it can be bad tomorrow. And we've seen this in really in, we've seen this in a way that in our in the span of our own lifetimes, we've seen it. In the span of our own lifetime, something that was bad 20 years ago, considered bad by everybody, now now that same thing is considered to be good or indifferent at the least. I feel that it's around yeah, that on the basic principle of ethics. There's no doubt about that. But uh, I think there is a room, as you see in the time and the different places, there are certain, you call it a custom or the thing the people do it, they are different I mean, in Muslim countries, Muslim societies, in one part of Africa is different, here is different, and India, Pakistan is different. That become the custom of that, and that become the part of the society, it becomes the part of ethics too. And like uh, I can give you that one example. And I was reading old books of like Chavriyula uh, and all of them. I said, every time they use the word Allah Sahib, it was very common. And when I first read it, it was very odd. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. Don't say Allah Sahib. So it is uh, sometimes some of the things become cultural, living in a certain society, and living at a different time. 
Yes. Uh, no, you're you're you're, you're you're absolutely right about that. But I'm I'm actually not speaking about these culturally uh, you know, these culturally specific traits and virtues. Right. So what I'm what I'm getting at is that law, ethics in Islam is something that is part of our deen, something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed. Yeah. Right? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi is the embodiment of the Qur'an itself. Right? So his virtue, his ethics, his morals, the way he was, his sunnah, right? that's an embodiment of the Qur'an. So it's not something that is just you know limited. There are certain things which are time-specific, culture-specific. So, so I'm trying to move away from that because, so, because there's no way to speak about that in a, uh, in a broad way, in a kind of comprehensive way. Because you know all of these things are uh, um, they change over time. But what is the ultimate purpose of ethics? First of all, it's connected to our deen. It's a fundamental part of what Islam is. As Imam Ibn Qayyim said, that it is another name for Islam is to have good character. Something so it's, it's much more you know as we say jana. It's much more comprehensive and much more uh, stronger than you know just the you know uh, time uh, changes of time and all of that. Uh, and it's part of uh, part of human nature. Allah created us in this way, and people desire. It. That's why Shawadiullah says here that uh, there there has been no nation possessing balanced temperament among humankind, which does not have it among uh, among it a group of great people who give it importance to the perfection of this innate character. So he's saying every people, every group, all across time, all across history, all across various cultures, all over the globe, everyone has always developed something that goes. And speaks to the perfection of good character, to develop, to find the character, because it's a part of our nature, part of our fitrah. Allah created us in this way, and because Allah created us this way, and He sent revelation for it. This is how we attain the qarab bil Allah, this ultimate felicity. So the ultimate aim, like the ultimate aim of Islam, is to foster good akhlaq. Yeah. Maybe this is why Islam produced so many uh, scholars and. People of such high akhlaq and refinement yes. and other that you know it's hard to find any other religious yes. tradition yes. because of this emphasis. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, that, that, that's that's a very good point. When when you start reading uh, literature, you start reading what these scholars are saying, uh, and you start reading them in Arabic and Persian and you know in the language and even in Urdu. Urdu is such a rich and beautiful language, so deep and profound. Uh, you really find. In just the, the way that they phrase things, the way they express their thoughts and ideas, just a, a, a pinnacle of refinement, pinnacle of refinement. Uh, and so it was, you know, you know, Quran and Sunnah was permeated into like into the civilizational structure of of the past. And I don't want to, you know, kind of romanticize everything, but I think we can speak about something that um, is kind of civilizational ethics in this sense. I think we can say something about that, and it's it's so evident in our in our discourse, as you said, in our in our literature. Right? Uh, like you know, uh, my sister here has uh, worked a lot on the Madaj. So you've taught it, you've read it, you've studied it, and and and, and we really don't have anything like that today. There is a book that I was actually looking at. It's in Urdu. Uh, when I was reading this, it's called Akhlaq um, or Falsify Akhlaq. Uh, by written by a um, scholar uh, who died in the 1960s, Hafsul Rahman Sahori, uh, was a great scholar of India, uh, and he wrote this like five, six hundred page book on uh, the philosophy of ethics in Islam. It's in Urdu. So if you read Urdu, you can look at it. But it's a, uh, but it's just, and and you know, and he speaks about the whole tradition, how Muslim scholars and thinkers have, have developed this category of akhlaq and ethics. Uh, and you'll find a lot of it in the soul, so much of it in the soul. Uh, so it's just something that we um, uh, don't have a lot of understanding about, uh, but the literature is is there. It's, it's available for us to to look at. And we should make some effort uh, for it. Anyway, uh, any other questions? And on, any online people who have questions or comments? It doesn't have to be a question, it could be a thought. Uh, this is just my understanding those categories where the way I had placed it, if someone even disagrees or uh, or make them better even. Yes. Um, when you were speaking about Allah in terms of the 
um, uh, at the gatherings. Uh, maybe it's explicitly um, said that you should allow the host to seat you in that the order that you do. Obviously, um, if it's natural, uh, the age, knowledge, so status. Is there also priority given to hosts in that list of trying to read them first because they invited you? Assuming it's like a larger dollar or something. Like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Sheikh Abdul Fatah, he says that uh, uh, that the person who should who who receives uh, who who ought to receive the, the first is person who is elderly or or a scholar, someone in knowledge. So he's 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 definitely thinking about these ranks, right? So, uh, but you know what naturally will happen is the first person who will welcome you home will probably be the host. So of course you can. Uh, so these so so we shouldn't look at these rules. In kind of a fixed sense, rather right? like this is what we have to do if we deviate from it. So we, obviously, we have to use our kind of our understanding and our own, you know, what is appropriate in our in the way that we have developed our culture today, and what is appropriate for us today. So bearing that in mind, um, generally speaking, right, you prioritize the elderly and the scholars, and people of virtue, nobility, you know, people who are kind of who have that type of uh, status, uh, you prioritize them first, but. You know, so like a large dhabit, like you said, so many people are there sometimes you can't get through or whatever the case is. So all of those contingencies aside, uh, you know, just understanding the kind of the principle at hand is that you prioritize uh, uh, the elder. Right? So from, that's the Prophet that we used to do. Abdul Shah Abdul Fatah, he quotes a hadith uh, in which the two brothers, they came to the Prophet to discuss something. And when they entered, the younger brother started speaking. And so the Prophet stopped and he said, no, 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 no. Your brother, your brother, your brother. The elder, the elder, the elder. And so he, he, he mentions that. So he said, no, give the chance for the elder one to speak first. And then it will be your turn. Right? So, so, so this is part of, you know, this is part of uh, what we learned from the Sunnah of the Prophet. But again, these things are not fixed in that sense. Right? These are not like hukum right? These are, uh, these are uh, things that you have to be wise about and use your, and, you know, use those, cultivating those four categories of other than Shuja and Ifa and all of those things to help and guide you into what is appropriate at, at, you know, at what time. Yes. Um, so <clears throat> this whole uh, discussion on Adab is um, so like difficult for us to convey to the younger generation because it's missing from society and even from Muslim homes. Um, and a lot of times the feedback you get from the younger generation is that, but this is not fault. Why do I have to do this? This is sunnah. This is not fault. And that mentality is actually encompassing a lot of areas of refinement, which is which are khlaq related, right? Not the refinement of character won't come from just doing the fault, right? So how do you impart the urgency and importance of embodying this while many of of it is not fun in the technical sense. So if, if we just look at, you know, this small section from uh, Imam Shah uh, he, he's talking about that the refinement of the soul is a human, is a, is a function of the human fitna. It's a need of, for the human being to be successful. And so it's not just a point of uh, a fixed kind of, you know, thing, obligation that you have to check off. Right. It's something much deeper than that. And so I think that to develop and to think about ways to impart um, uh, virtues that said that, that the, the underlying message is that this is what is good for your soul. This is why Allah created you. And if you don't do this, if you abandon this, then you are abandoning something, a part of your uh, development as a human being. You're, you're abandoning something at the core of what it means to be a human being. Uh, so I think on a philosophical level, I think that that has to be kind of a driving force that akhlaq in Islam, ethics in Islam is about uh, fulfilling the desire, that, fulfilling the need that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created in the human being to become refined. That's number one. And number two, we have to uh, cultivate it, live it, and show it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like that, hadith, that the story of Qadi Abu Yala and his student talking right so so he's, he's walking and he says do you know where uh, do you know how to honor someone and he said no so he said uh, you know walk behind them walk a few steps behind them 
uh, don't walk on their left side because they may need to spit or to walk, you know, uh, clean dirt off of their clothes. Walk on their right side. And it's time for prayer. Put them in at first. So what are all of these things? These are all habits. These are all embodied practices, things that we physically do, right? Um, and so much of uh, the way that young people learn uh, is by watching and observing. And so we have to kind of do these things and be aware of these things uh, and model it for them. You can't model it in the sense of, you know, if you don't have it, you're trying to model it. It has to be something that we really kind of deeply have. So it's really a requirement for us to uh, work on our own selves, to develop these things first, to work hard. It really requires a great deal of effort to cultivate good character. Um, you know, good uh, company, you know, being a good, all, all of those things, uh, uh, they help as well. But I think um, uh, and the, big, the other big challenge is that we're being bombarded with another uh, source of ethics, another source of what it means to be good. And unfortunately, young children uh, today, teenagers and college people, college students, uh, you know, TikTok and Instagram and these things are just, you know, uh, they're closer to them than their, their parent, own parents. They have a much closer relationship with social media and, and the things that go on there with actors and celebrities and athletes and all of these things that we do with our own family members. And, you know, it's unfortunate, it's unfortunate the way it's, uh, it's happened. So we, we're really swimming against the tide. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, at least the least we can do is we can take time from our lives, all of us, take time from our lives to study these great scholars. And like, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Like, you know, you know better than me. Imam Bithayim, like, you wrote a, what is a two, three volume work on this, right? There's tomes, libraries are filled with this literature. So it's our job, it's our responsibility, this is our tradition, this is our heritage, to go and to read it, at least learn from it, and then try to embody it as best as we can. Um, but, you know, knowledge, right? Like, knowledge is very important. We have to at least make an effort. And, and so a lot of the stuff is not translated. Imam uh, Ibn Qayyim's Madarij has been recently translated into English. It's a wonderful translation. You can find it um, by our own professor, uh, Ovemir Andrum translated it. Um, but so, so much of the uh, material is not translated. So, so what, is that, what does that require of us? We just wait for someone else to do the translation? No, we should strive, make effort to actually learn Arabic or to learn Persian, to learn Urdu, to learn these languages, make effort. Uh, strive and to struggle to, to do that because, you know, if you have children, you have to teach them something. And if you don't have children, you will eventually. Uh, and forget children, even for our own selves, our, our, our own uh, betterment. All of these things are very, very important, even for our own betterment. So uh, making effort, right? So uh, we, make, we make a lot of effort. We make so much effort for uh, other purposes, but uh, we should also do it for uh, our lean, our own understanding. And so, you know, I think one of the big things that we lack today is we have a relationship with uh, our knowledge, our, 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 you know, our Islamic tradition, I should say, um, which, you know, like there was probably nothing, what's there, we don't know, we're kind of lost, we're looking for new things, self help, you know, Instagram uh, influencers and these people to kind of teach us. No, we have a great tradition, great tradition, uh, deep, profound real wisdom. Look, look, look at, I just shared with you just two snippets from a, a figure like Nietzsche, right? Like, you know, what, is, what does that tell you about the trajectory that Western civilization has gone? And, you know, one of, my, one of my colleagues, he said to me, he said, it's so interesting, in the history of Islam, there's never been a figure like Nietzsche in the history of Islam, someone who rejected everything. Never, like we've gone through so, historically Islam has gone through, our civilization has gone through so many ups and downs, especially over the last 300 years, colonization, you know, currently what's going on in the world, Muslims are at the lowest uh, in every category, in every rank. Uh, but there's something that's still, you know, true, right? Something that's still there that is attracting so many di different types of people. That is not, uh, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah used to say that we were people of the Qibla. You know, one of my teachers used to say that we, there's so much we have lost as believe, as, as, the, as an ummah, but the one thing we have not lost, we have not lost our qibla. We have the qibla, whereas others have lost theirs. So we have a lot to hold on to, a great deal to hold on to. It is our job, it's our responsibility to go and to 
uh, uh, excavate it, to, to, to retrieve it, and to bring it back, and to share it with ourselves, with our families, with our children, with our communities. So it's, uh, I think this is a, this is one thing that we can do. Not everyone can do this. You can do this. Some others can do this. Uh, but uh, but that's perhaps perhaps where we should begin. But I don't have you know proper answers. <laughs> yes, problem. Yeah, um, I guess just on the point about we learn from what we see, not just what we're taught or what we're told. Just like a personal reflection. Um, one of the inspirations behind this course online is just in the little class. Um, in our downstairs area, to the point where we can agree, we can think about um, modesty and entering people's homes. Um, I think you would apply it even to people's rooms or spaces of the house. I, I don't think I ever once saw him come up the stairs. Um, without announcing himself or asking for my father first. Um, really, he could have, you know, his, his home at my door. Um, but I learned a lot just from that. Um, and, you know, part of it that I kind of think about it, house that I mean, even if she wasn't, you know, that she wasn't, or even just me, um, still, he wouldn't come up unless he announced himself and then announced his intentions. Sometimes even ask permission and then come up to I think that uh, speaks to a little bit of the point about how people act and embody um, yeah. those traits even within a home, uh, even within one family home. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's such a such a beautiful uh, point. Uh, I'll repeat it for the people online. Uh, is uh, the brother was what's your name? Daniel. Daniel was saying that uh, Sheikh Yusuf Islahi, Mawlana Yusuf Islahi. Um, would stay in his home, he would always make it a priority to announce himself when entering uh, upstairs and uh, you know, embodying so many of these virtues that we uh, spoke about today. Um, and you know, I think you know, uh, you know, when he passed, Sheikh Abu Zayn said that he was you know, one of the last kind of figures of a generation that perhaps has no more people like that anymore left. So he was so you know a, a person like Sheikh Yusuf Islahi, he, he was he, he was uh, nurtured and cultivated and developed in in a world that still exists that a world that existed that still had these virtues you know that were that were part of society that were part of the fabric of their society they grew up in that he was nurtured in that that was his world and 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 you find that you know uh, when you read old books when you read people like you know that generation or even before. You find that they, even in the way that they wrote, they embodied uh, all of these, you know, uh, these beautiful virtues. Um, and so, you know, we are losing touch with a generation because people don't live forever; people die. So we are losing touch with a generation that embodied, you know, you know, the, the, the most noblest uh, virtues. And you know, I'm a firm believer. I think that there's no, like, you know, if we if we look at it. Uh, as human civilization, not religious, right? If you look at Islam as a as a just a sort of the product of historical time as a civilization, I don't think you'll find anything comparable to it when it comes to the development of virtue. I don't think you'll find anything close to it. Um, and there are people that we saw that we witnessed in our own lifetimes that still had that you know that tinge, that touch of it, that they they had the air of it. Right. And you know, and you know, especially if you when you would see him, the way he would dress, the way he just he had an air, he had a presence about him that just uh, the, these virtues emanated from him. That they emanated from him. Right. And unfortunately, we don't have that presence anymore. We just don't have that, that same type of presence. So, but uh, um, perhaps we can't um, uh, uh, re. Uh, you know, mimic that. We can't, you know, copy that and bring it in our time. But we can do something different. We can do something else that's anchored and rooted deeply in that same tradition, and give it a different form that is that can work in our time today. That can work for our context uh, today. But you know, to make the effort, inshallah, we'll have some time. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. So. With that, we end. Jazakallah khair for your coming and for your participation. Uh, any mistakes that I made are uh, mine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala,
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and the lack of engagement with our uh, with our past, with our own tradition, with what our ulama have written about uh, these topics. Um, I think so many of these factors uh, have contributed, but uh, I'm sorry I didn't get the question. Uh, you can call me or email me, I'll be happy to, uh, to talk more uh, about this question. Unfortunately, we are running out of time and I forgot about the ulama, sorry. Thank you. 